Hi folks, sorry I'm not there. Um, I have got to go to a funeral later. In fact, it starts tomorrow, but um, that kind of helps because it's part of the subject matter of the data I'm going to present. Um, I'm going to tell you a short story, 20 minutes, and in it amongst it is around an, an iPhone application and a back end and really records personal uh, attachments, um, but you, you'll see, you'll see. But in the meantime, um, it might be fun if you do connect to me in real time. Yeah, I know this is real time, but real time. Um, I'm going to talk about an application called Comobnet, and it's on the iPhone on the App Store. So if you've got an iPhone, uh, you've got 20 minutes to do this. Um, hey, I'm going to be boring. So uh, go to the App Store, download Comobnet. It's completely free. And then um, when you kick it up, well, you'll see the little icon like this over here. Um, and then it will boot up and look a bit like this. And then you'll see a settings page, which looks like this. And you can see in the group name, if you put the name, the letters Isaiah, lowercase, I've kept it. Um, and then turn your show names on and then simply hit map view. You'll actually should see, well, you'll see me actually entering a city called Wolverhampton in the UK. And hopefully some lines will be drawn between us. And what I'll talk about now will be what these lines mean and how they constitute very, very fragile relationships. The sort of relationships which we're very closely bonded to, but actually only constituted on a GPS point or a couple of GPS points. Um, anyway, over to the talk. Thanks. Bye. So what you're watching there is um, an intro image, really, from Britain from Above which is a BBC movie that really documented uh, or used spatial imagery to talk about the scale of Britain, really. And um, in this particular piece, they used taxi trails. Um, and it is, it's is—it's a beautiful animation. It's very interesting. and it, it allows you to begin to sense the scale of um, taxi activity across London through a working day. But, but back in 2010 at IZ, we presented... Uh, myself and Jen saw an, an, um, an iPhone app and that tried to offer a different way of thinking in way thinking about how GPS could be used. Um, traditionally, we know many artists, Dan Belasco, for example, have been mapping and using trails to GPS trails to map their activity. Um, but in many ways, we seem to have, what we posited at the time, but we've fallen into a trap of seeing trails and linearity um, as core to satnav and that Tom Toms and iPhones all offer us this linear path um, in which start points and end points are perhaps core to GPS. Um, as you, you know and the community knows, start and end points aren't part of the internet. They're not part of webs. Um, webs are uh, distributed and highly decentralised. So when talking about how to develop a piece of software that perhaps capitalised on this network model of GPS, uh, we started playing around with a very simple model in which we would collect a series of iPhones, all had GPS technology. Um, we would, instead of seeing them recording individual trails, we would simply link them together. This linking together would then lead to a, perhaps a topology or some kind of connection. And in a very simple example in Dundee, we presented back in 2010 how the lines of individual paths across Dundee of about 20 architect students actually could be translated into a topology by taking individual points and spatialising them as a group, not as individual linear paths. So from then, myself and Jen Southern began to look particularly at what would happen then if you began to map and connect individuals if you gave them one iPhone app um, but the app allowed them to visualize the connection the spatial connection between each other if they chose to be in that group and this is a very very crude animation from way back in the day um, since then and and actually this is imagery from um, um, 2010 Isaiah when we we're in Belfast as you can see you can see what's happening here is someone's holding an iPhone and running Comob net which is the free app on the iPhone store, available then, still is, um, that the individual is the blue dot on the right, and they're in a group, they're in a mob. And as long as everyone in the application is type is, is registered under that same mob or that group name, you begin to see a lasso around them in time and space. And it's live, so if someone moves, you begin to see this strange elastic band move around in real time. 
Um, at the time, we began to people would go for a walk across Belfast, would bring them back to uh, the workshop, and we would discuss their movement across um, different cities. And you can see there on the left that's actually um, the Isaiah Centre, and people beginning to generate very large mobs across the town centre. So now, really, I just wanted to show you some of the information, which has been very discreet, very small, as the, the, the app has moved into the real world and people have started to download it. It's been downloaded an awful lot for a small mobbing uh, GPS critique, if you like. Um, we've been down an awful lot. And this is just one snapshot of 24 hours use. Um, so on any occasion, you know, 40, 50 people are inside here. And what you're looking at here is a collection of all the groups. So actually over on the left, Eduardo and Jay Nuffield might constitute one single line. In the UK, you can see tens and twenties of people all stacked over each other. But actually, all of those people are in separate, discrete groups. So it's proved very popular. The problem is, with this kind of software, when you release an application like um, Comobnet, you're not allowed to track back and find out who these people are really and what they're using it for. We, we put information on that say, hey, please jump on and tell us what you're using it for. But of course, no one tells us. Um, and actually, we can delve through the database and we've got names, but who knows really if they're real names and who knows what they're really trying to say. We've also got the groups, um, but as you'll see, some of those groups evidently don't tell all of the story. So what I want to do now is just show you some of the very fragile relationships that have constituted um, some of Comop activity. Um, I mean, the application, when we, what we have is a processing application that sits on the, um, the back end of a... Um, well, it sits on the front end, sorry, of a back-end PHP MySQL database and that simply records GPS points as people move. And it only works when they kick up the app, although they can keep it in the background, but it records an awful lot. And we've got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of um, points now um, across time and space. So you get very interesting imagery as you begin to talk about this collection of data, the sort of image that I know Mike enjoys speculating as being network architectures. Um, but this time I wanted to focus on some of the work that Jen's been doing in capturing what we call portraits. Um, so let me take you through some of these portraits. Now they're going to be slow and I'm going to slow the talk down now really to, to demonstrate what we think is going on here. This is just one family. Um, it doesn't matter really who they are. But what you begin to see through 2009 in, um, in September, um, and what Jen's doing now, and myself is doing, was speeding, simply speeding through the hours to begin to talk about this very fragile relationship. Now, from our perspective, it's just a portrait of a family. There's two people. One appears to stay at home while the other moves on certain days, not every day, moves out into the world and begins to navigate spaces. We haven't provided the, the base map. We, we could do, but in these portraits, we really didn't want to divulge too much personal information. And we thought it was actually more elegant simply to ponder and to watch these portraits. What we see at this point, another member of the family has joined. Again, someone still remains back at home. We're speculating it's a family, of course, because it, it might not be. It might be a relationship of any kind. It might be a business. But what you begin to see over these curious days is just people plotting their relationship or, or the, perhaps their connections. So what are they? they they're, they're the evidence of securities? Is it people demonstrating that they they want to stay in touch with each other. And how delicate the line is, really, in constituting that presence. When you run the iPhone app, all you really do see is a line. You could choose to see your name and the name of your partner, but essentially it's just a line between two people. This is another image, um, a different family. And as we speed up here, we begin to see their movement um, across time and space and across um, areas, beginning just to, to map each other. And we begin to see and follow and track this, the, the, these perhaps more adventurous boundaries. It's made up of four or five people at different points. In fact, it inflates 
um, quite far. And what we begin to see, if you notice the date, this is actually the, it's Christmas Day. And what we postulate is happening is that at some point on the day, they begin to connect more and more family members through that day. Now, people could join any group, and this particular group are, as it states, called the motherfuckers. Now, we don't know what the motherfuckers map, we don't know what the mob constitutes, but you'll see, and you'll get an idea, that actually the connections and the activity of the motherfuckers is across quite a, a smaller area. Again, we, we don't show you the map, we're trying to keep the portraits as simple as possible. But the motherfuckers seem to be operating in a town centre and it documents activity of this little group as they move around. And you begin to see a bit more actual time activity. So it's bursts of um, activity. Now we speculate it could be a skateboarding group, it could be kids, it could be who knows what it is. But they seem to be much more active and their place in space is much more important because they're beginning to find each other. And you begin to see more incremental movements, um, perhaps across town blocks or city blocks, um, as a little group. So I'll, I'll move to probably our most fascinating um, couple, um, who we've gleaned our truckers in Laredo. Now, um, the Laredo is in, situated around the border, Mexico and America. It's quite a tense border. Um, and we believe that they're truckers because they seem to stop in particular truck stops in the area, funnily enough. Um, now, this, 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 we call them a couple, but that doesn't mean to say there's any other relations other than perhaps being co-workers. Um, and we're just introducing the landscape here, and I will give you one inkling of themselves in a sense of space. So let me introduce you to, to Eduardo and Norma. Now, this is a year in their life. What's fascinating about this couple is that as they move, they move to a truck stop and then turn it on, document where they are, appear to look for the other to constitute a line, and then they essentially turn off until they move to another point. So there is no home. You perhaps will see regular truck stops, but you also begin to see significant jumps away from centres of space. So... What we're really looking at is connections and what we think are security. Now, we don't know, again, why they're using it. We don't know if the organisation, the company, is asking them to use it or whether it's just two people trying to find a connection and trying to use it to begin to monitor each other's activity, either as safety, either as surveillance, either as um, even a love affair, love affair, why not? But what you begin to see, this lovely play out of um, a relationship across a time and space. These are just data. This is just data. They're just two long and lats, and we just happen to be drawing a line between them, just as artists have done. And it's, I suppose the point of this particular presentation is that data can be very, very, very small to constitute a great deal of meaning. Um, two IP addresses, two telephone numbers two GPS points, two postcodes or zip codes, it's enough to constitute a great deal of meaning between two people or a family. So you don't need much data to make meaning. And what we've tried to do here, is I'll, I'll let this play out just a little bit more, is just try and envisage these human beings, these social relations, these traces, and what type of connection it is that constitutes a relationship between them. So I'll go quiet for a minute and then I'll let you ponder that and I'll just close in a moment. There, how was that? So, I'm just gonna now, I think digesting that idea that these are two people um, 
but actually they're just dots on a screen. Um, and then returning perhaps to this extraordinary image by the BBC, and it is fantastic, it's visual, it's rich. Having said that, it also strikes myself and Jen as deeply lonely. These aren't necessarily connected lines. They're just people moving other people around. And they might just be the lines of people moving to a person and moving them along. But there is no connection between these taxes. They're all absolutely individual worms. They're discreet. There may be someone that's sent at, at, at back at base talking to them, but actually they're pretty lonely lines. And whilst it's a terrific animation, it also talks about sometimes when we need to get data right and talk about representation, that it's about the connection, the social connections that I think myself and Jen are particularly interested in, in, in these, these delicate relationships. So that's me. Um, um, thank you very much. And, oh, look, there's Andrew Marr. <laughs>